As much as life has changed over the last year, you're still pretty busy, so consider convenient COVID-19 testing from Quest. Get the same tests hospitals use without a doctor visit. Simply order online, select from drive through or at-home options, and get results sent securely to your phone or computer. It's a great fit for your busy life. With over 25 million COVID-19 tests processed, you can count on Quest. So order your test today at questcovid19.com. That's questcovid19.com. From websites and online stores to marketing tools and analytics, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business. There are no hidden fees or price hikes, and all websites are optimized for mobile. And it's so simple. Start with a design template and use drag and drop tools to make it your own. Head to squarespace.com slash StarTalk for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, use offer code StarTalk to save 10% off your first purchase. Welcome to StarTalk, your place in the universe where science and pop culture collide. StarTalk begins right now. This is Star Talk. I'm your host, Neil deGrasse Tyson, your personal astrophysicist. And today we're going to talk about ancient climate change. Ancient as in during the time we've been human and maybe even a little bit of our pre-human ancestors. And what impact does climate change have on our diets? What did they eat? And was it good for them? <laughs> Okay, I, I don't have any expertise in this at all, other than the fact that I eat food. So uh, we brought in an expert for this. But before we introduce that expert, let me show you my co-host for today, Matt Kirsch. And Matt, welcome back. Hey, thanks, Neil. How you doing? Dude, dude, are you still doing that show, Most Likely Could Be Science? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's probably science. Prob uh, prob yeah, you know, I don't know why I cannot remember that. It's... It's it's an, it's amazing. You're so good at remembering so many facts, and that one seems to slip your mind every time. I don't. I I don't know if you saw, by the way. My uh, I don't. You got a sh shout out from my co-host on Jeopardy last month. Oh really? Okay. Uh, Andy, my the other probably science host had a. He did all right. He 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 did us proud on Jeopardy. Oh, but he was competing. He was a contestant. He was competing. Yeah. Oh. And uh, uh, one of his anecdotes, one of his little uh short. Bits of information was about the podcast and dropped the fact that you were at one point in his living room <laughs> as a friend of the show. <laughs> well, excellent. Excellent. So now I got to remember it exactly. Okay. Probably science. Very That's good. Very good. So uh, Matt and I will welcome today a, uh, someone I met through someone else at the American Museum of Natural History, which it's an institution. Yes, we have astrophysicists there, but mostly they're like people who care about like cultures, anthropology, uh, animal kingdom. And uh, so there's a whole other place where I get some sort of osmotic uh, thoughts about just what's going on in the rest of the scientific universe. And we have with us Tina Ludecki. Did I say that right, Tina? Ludic, mm, almost, but no American can, so don't feel bad about this. Ludic, Ludic, yes. <laughs> Ludic, excellent, excellent. We have you on this show today because you are a geochemist and you're you're dialing in from Germany. You're a geochemist and you focus on um, what is it? reconstructing paleo ecosystems, paleo ecosystem, paleo diets, paleo everything, basically. Yep. So you you're you're a you're a Sherlock Holmes of their lives. Okay, yes, I take that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Because they, because they didn't have books for you to read about what they did. So you have to like piece together the artifacts and reconstruct what was going on uh in in in, in, in everyday everyday occurrences, right? Yep. Is that, that that's what you do? Basically, yes. Yeah. Okay, so your your current title is your. Let I me mean, read my notes here. You're a postdoc mm -hmm. at the Sneckenberg Biodiversity and Climate Research Center Sneckenberg, in Frankfurt, yeah. Germany. Excellent, mm -hmm. excellent. And you're also affiliated with the University of Oxford mm -hmm. over in England and the Max Planck Institute for Chemistry exactly. in Mainz, Mainz, Germany. How did yes, I do? That is correct. Did Not I get a bad. B plus? <laughs> 
you do, yes. <laughs> well, it's difficult with all those things. I'm just about to switch jobs, so it's, yeah, it's not. From Don't switch Sankenberg. jobs. We just worked from, on this. No, no, from Sankenberg, <laughs> from my main affiliation, I would say, from Sankenberg to the Max Planck Institute. So. Oh, gotcha. It was shifting. Okay. You, you have Thank everything. You. I'm just switching. Yeah, don't change job titles because then, I, you know, we worked hard on this one. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> you did well. For our sake. <laughs> so, so tell me about your research because we, we were at a gathering of, of museum colleagues. And that's when I learned more fully what you were into. I said, whoa, we got to get that on Star Talk." And so tell me what your research entails and how do you piece together what ancient people ate? So basically my main research lies on the reconstruction of four to one million year old South African paleo landscapes. So a time frame we can't even usually cope if you don't have an four education. million years four old. Four million years old is are my oldest samples. Yes, wow. well, my oldest so, samples are twelve million years, but I will not talk about these here. So human evolution there it's a really interesting time between four and one million years old because a lot of things happened. You had a lot of different hominid taxa that lived, like they coexisted, so they lived in the same habitat. Okay, when you say hominid taxa, okay, so you mean. So we are humans. Mm -hmm. well, well, let me back up. Just tell me if yeah. I got this right. When we think of rodents, we can think of rats and mice mm -hmm. and dozens of other species within the rodent family, right? Yeah. So are we in the hominid family, but we only have one species? Is that, right. is now, that correct? In the hominin, oh. we only have one species. They They... Terms are ch changing there quite often, but in the hominin taxa, we are the only remaining species. Okay, so you're going back to a time where there were more than what we call humans mm -hmm. as hominids walking around. So we have Homo and Australopithecus, um, Pantopus, Adipithecus, for example. They all coexisted at some point in time and space, possibly. They oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, so so in the hominid family or you said the, the, the name the word changed just so i can be so yeah, yeah hominid is basically that would nowadays also mean um great apes like orangutans or um, gorillas chimps and everything and all their ancestors matt i knew an ape one time and i thought he was a great ape i thought he was a good <laughs> I, <thought. laughs> I i'm still i i'm still sort of coming to terms with the fact that there were so many of them living at the same time because you know, I, I'm picturing the picture that we've all seen of the sort of uh, the the going from this to da 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 da. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm a lot of people are listening to the audio version, so they won't see what I'm doing. But you can imagine what I'm Some doing. Some linear I'm sequence over, and then I'm standing more and more. Yeah. There we go. Yeah, and then you start and crouching so I, back I over again over your computer. Is, yes. Okay. Yeah, which is what I'm doing right the full now. Full evolution and, of it all. <laughs> but it wasn't uh, the linear. So basically that's why we don't and then, even... And then we end up as just brains in jars. <laughs> so I think that's the final picture. But... Brains in jars are really yeah, but... important. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's very important, Tina. You're saying it was not linear. So there are times when multiple uh, uh, homo species were coexisting. Mm -hmm. And that's hard to picture because look how tribalized we are just as one species. Imagine... Oh, yeah. If yeah. there are other uh, hominids walking around, I mean, I can't even picture what we how we exactly. treat each other. And we call it even not a family tree really anymore, but many people like to call it a family bush, basically, because there are so many branches. And then, of course, new species evolved, others um, went extinct. So you have the come and go of many species. Two of them became president, one tried and failed. <laughs> <laughs> yes. so, I, so, so this is before what we would consider today as anatomically accurate humans. Is Modern that humans, you would say, yes, yes. Modern humans, Basically. sorry, okay. Okay, so now, so this is the paleo era. Okay, that's cool. Mm -hmm. So now what did you find? So so basically, I, I tried to reconstruct how paleo environment changed. So how did the landscape, the habitat and everything change over time? And with that, like, how did the hominins in it change, especially their diet, which is the main driver for evolution, of course. Like, the energy you put in, you can use for something, basically. So, and as a geochemist, my favorite tools are stable isotope systems. So I work with isotopes, um, which means I basically different isotopes of different elements can like fingerprint different settings, different environmental proxies or what somebody ate. So um, mm. I look at carbon, oxygen and nitrogen. And for example, carbon isotope systems can tell me what kind of plant was growing on a site or what 
kind of plant and animal ate, also early human, for example, ate. So I think I think Whole Foods now has an isotope section of the <laughs> where you can. <laughs> I only buy the heavy stuff. <laughs> yeah, it does sound very much like something that's represented by a glowing image in an advert. Well, so that too. Yeah, the, the glowing aisle. These are the isotopes. If you want to totally mimic. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that actually exists yet. That would be fun to just like, for example, water. Water tells us about what kind of um, water is present. So oxygen in the water shows us, for example, is the water from a small puddle of leftover rain, basically, that evaporated and you only have a little bit of water remaining in a super arid environment, for example. Or is it from a river or a big lake that is present all year round in a music house? Okay, so this is deep. So what you're saying is... Um Again, I'm only repeating so I make sure I understand. And um, so, so oxygen, as we know, um, it has sort of eight protons and eight neutrons in its nucleus. So we think of, of happy oxygen as oxygen 16, right? Eight plus that is eight. the one we learn in school, yes. 16. That's the one we learn about in yes. school. And then you can find versions of oxygen that have extra neutrons. One of them is uh, has eight neutrons and eight electrons and 10 neutrons. This would be oxygen 18, mm -hmm. right? So now if you make water, because hydrogen doesn't care, it just cares that it's oxygen, right? right? So hydrogen binds with the oxygen. Some of them will be bound with oxygen 18, others with oxygen 16. And now the water is just standing there and you have slow evaporation. Mm -hmm. So is it correct to think that the lighter water molecule will evaporate preferentially relative to the heavier water molecule. Exactly. So that standing water will ultimately have more oxygen 18 mm -hmm. water molecules than fresh water that just came in. Is that is that did I get that right? Exactly. And then if you for example drink from that water and I pull your tooth out and measure it and I can see on this <laughs> You just do this. <laughs> I, do, I do that all the time. <laughs> yes. I'm not visiting your lab. She's doing. Okay, let's say, let's say one says, hey, you might not be here anymore and you get fossilized. I, know, I want to die first and in, then you can pull my okay. teeth out, okay? And then in four million years, I will come and I will yes. find your tooth and your tooth is so resistant to diagenesis, so to doing processes as fossilization, basically, that your isotopic fingerprint is still present in your tooth. So 4 million years later, or even 20 million years later, if preservation as well, I can see what kind of water you drank. So did you live in New York and you drank from the Hudson River? Or did you live in the Savannah and you have a tiny puddle of just a little bit of standing water full of mosquitoes and bugs? Wait a minute. So you, had, so you, already, you can identify Hudson water. Which isotope <laughs> is that? <laughs> Okay. You don't want to know. Okay. Want to know. <laughs> now we get really deep. So it's, I mean, you can, with isotopes, you can actually see where a product came from in soil and in something. I was, I would not be able to right now have 10 samples and pick out which one is Hudson River and which one is the East River or anything. But all I'm saying is I can see what kind of water it has. Like if it's evaporative water or if it's in a lush bean landscape, basically water that is available all over the place, which is, of course, for our human evolution, quite interesting. If those early hominins had a lot of water stress and they had to migrate long distances or they, I don't know, they couldn't find any water and would maybe die of in a drought. What, what, what I love about this is that you are taking, you're, you're speaking as a chemist, but you're applying your chemistry background to paleontology. I am, I am a geologist, actually. I am a geosciences by training as my undergrad. And then, but then I focused on geochemistry a long time ago, like a long time in my time frame, not in geological time frame. <laughs> she was there when the... Um, the, <laughs> the last 10 years. <laughs> in the last 10 years. So, so when we hear the paleo diet, which is showing yes. up, it, it, it rears its head every now and then. And my first thought is, you know, paleo people didn't really live much past 30. Do I want to eat the way they do? <laughs> Why is that something we should emulate? Uh, so well, tell me, what is the, what is the, I don't want to ask a health food person. I want to ask you, yes. what the hell is a paleo diet? And that is a question we, there is no paleo diet, I think. So if you think about, I just talked about three to four million years time span. 
and early hominins that evolved, that um, lived in different areas and different like continents, basically, in younger times, they expanded to Europe and everything. So they had really different resources available and everything. So if somebody talks about the paleo diet, I always think, how paleo do you want to go? Like, how far back do you want to go? Do you want to eat like an Australopithecus three million years ago? <laughs> or, uh, I don't know, Neanderthal, which is not that long ago, but lived in a very different, um, a very different environment, nevertheless. So for me, it's always really difficult to understand the paleo diet. And if I then read up on it, which of course I should, because I get this question sometimes, <laughs> um, then I'm always thinking another point is you can't get a paleolithic diet. So we modified our food so widely, like plants, but also animals were were manipulated, basically. If you think about a banana, for example, it used to look very, very different. Now we have those beautiful bananas, but they can't even reproduce. They don't have seeds anymore. And while a meal that for our ancestors was healthy, because they were running around in the savanna, they were hunter and gatherers, they were outside all day long, they didn't necessarily became that old, but they were really healthy. They had a good nutrition. They were vital. They, They're they, vital, they had, exactly. Yes, mm -hmm, they mm -hmm. thrived usually and everything. And then we started this agricultural lifestyle, basically, which was in a way awesome for us because it was possible to, it made our population explode, basically. Suddenly you had crops, you could maintain food, you could store it often if you're at one place and everything. But of course, then people were also getting more obese, they had cavities, they got sickness by living together in close proximity with animals, for example, and all of this. We even had to invent a word to describe when everybody gets sick from having getting a disease from animal. Pandemic, okay. Very present Actually, this year, yes. We, uh, we got to take a quick break, but when we come back, more of Tina Ludecki. Not bad. Uh, who's our paleo expert in the house, and we'll see you guys in just a moment. Exploring the secrets of the cosmos is a fascinating pursuit, but have you discovered the vast and incredible potential of your own mind? Introducing Advanced Nootropic Formula from B-Thrive, the Vitamin Shop brand. Available at vitaminshop.com or your local Vitamin Shop store. This stimulant-free formula supports cognitive function, neuron development and repair, and brain-derived nootropic factor to promote the survival of existing neurons and encourage growth of new synapses. Non-GMO advanced nootropic formula features clinically studied ingredients like Synapsa for peak cognitive performance, Cognizant for mental energy, focus, and attention, and clinically proven in extra so you can stay extra sharp. In fact, you may experience an improvement in alertness for up to five hours. As always, all V Thrive, the Vitamin Shop brand products are simply clean with no magnesium, stearic, stearic acid, or titanium dioxide. Advanced Nootropic Formula comes with a quality promise you can trust with ingredient purity and potency verified by independent third-party labs. The best part? It's on sale. Save 15% on purchases of $40 or more when you use code STARTALK at vitaminshop.com today. Again, that's 15 15% off purchases of $40 or more with code STARTALK on vitaminshop, S-H-O-P-P-E dot com to expand your mental universe today. Are you always taking care of your family? Do you often take care of others and not yourself? Well, now is the time to take care of yourself because you deserve it. Teladoc gives you access to licensed therapists to help you get back to feeling your best, to feeling like yourself again. Sometimes we don't know how much we need to talk to somebody. Take it from me personally. During the entire pandemic, I have had virtual sessions and it has been such an incredible help. Now with Teladoc, you can speak to a licensed therapist by phone or video. Therapy appointments are available seven days a week from 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. local time. Hey, maybe you're feeling overwhelmed. Maybe you feel stressed or anxious or depressed or lonely, or you might be struggling with a family issue. Teladoc can help. 
No need to wait months to get a therapist. Teladoc is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches so they make it easy to change counselors if needed for free. Teladoc therapy is available through most insurance or employers, and individual plans are also available. Download the app or visit teladoc.com slash StarTalk today to get started. T-E-L-A-D-O-C dot com slash StarTalk. Hey, I'm Roy Hill Percival, and I support Star Talk on Patreon. Bringing the universe down to Earth, this is Star Talk with Neil deGrasse Tyson. We're back. Star Talk. We're talking about the paleo diet and paleo climate with Tina Ludecki. Did I get that right, Tina? Almost. Ludic. Almost. Okay, we'll keep working on it. And of course, Matt Kirshen as my co-host. Always good to have you back, Matt. Lovely to be here. We're thinking about the paleo, paleo, uh, Tina, what do I call that period of time? Paleo- Paleolithic or neogene? Neogene, paleolithic, okay. We have lots of different terms, a lot of different spans. Okay, all right, I'll go with it. (laughs) I'll take them all. (laughs) And so in there, you're thinking about not only climate, but environment in which our ancestors lived. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued because when people say, I want to go on a paleo diet, and you're telling us that different places had different diets. So there is no one paleo diet. And so you are figuring this out from your scientific investigations. You told us about the oxygen and an isotope oxygen of oxygen. Oxygen and carbon. Yeah. Carbon, also, we, we all know carbon-14, right? That's a famous carbon isotope. So maybe you noticed that so far I only talked about the plant-based diet, right? So with, with carbon, I can look at what kind of plants were eaten. And um, nitrogen is actually a great tool to reconstruct the meat-based part of the diet. So it was meat consumed by the individualized sample. And we see with each trophic level, basically, the delta-15N values would increase. So this would be a nitrogen-15, which is the isotope of the, the happy nitrogen at 14, which is seven protons, seven neutrons. Okay, so you look at the ratio of those two, and what does that tell you? Exactly. So this usually tells me trophic level. So was meat consumed or not? And here it's interesting. So this system is well established. I mean, there are, as always, loose ends about it, but it's well established. But it was only possible to measure, actually, on samples that were like up to 100, 150,000 years old, basically. So some Neanderthals were measured, for example, but 150,000 years. And I just said, I want to look at millions of years. So I was always bothered by the fact that I could reconstruct on ancients, like in really early hominins, I could reconstruct the plant-based diet, but I could not look at the meat part of the diet. And we have stone tools, we have cut marks, which are like three and a half million years old or something. So cut marks on fossilized bones. So we have indicators that meat consumption started quite early in hominins, but no, it was not possible to actually look into this. All right, so you're inferring, I, I, obviously, correctly, no doubt, that you see bones of animals that have, uh, fossilized bones of animals that have markings on them, indicating that someone was hacking at them, cutting, perhaps cutting away meat, yeah. So with some kind of tool. Yeah, with a tool. And why would you do that unless you were going to eat the animal? But that's the question. Who exactly did it? Who mm-hmm. I mean, we don't find an Australopithecus with a stone tool and a cut mark bone in his hand, basically. So we don't have direct evidence who actually did it. Mm-hmm. So so I was really frustrated about the fact that that it was not able to, that I was not able to reconstruct the meat part of the diet. And then finally this year only, actually, basically. I was able to establish a method to measure nitrogen on fossil teeth and um, with colleagues from the MPIC and especially Jennifer Lickleiter. So I was able to... MPIC, now the, Max Planck Max Planck Institute. Institute exactly. Mm-hmm. And um, now finally, for the first time ever, we are able to have direct evidence of meat consumption, or we can have it if we measure different hominins, of which hominins started when to include meat in their diet and what that possibly means like for the success of our species, for example, or the extinction of other species. So this would have been the beginning. Once they figured out how to eat meat, uh, Matt, do you think I'm right here? This is... This is this is the birth of vegetarians because they want to <laughs> they don't want to eat the meat. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't eat meat, and I would have been very unspecial in the before carnival yeah. time. So it's, what, what would you even talk about? How would you distinguish yourself at a party? You must become vegan make, then. How would you make yourself a nuisance? Yeah, they're vegans. Where are the vegans? Right. We haven't invented vegans yet. We basically have, if you take away breast milk. So, of course, early hominins were also not yet eating or drinking milk in, when, once they were older. So after weaning, after taking away the breast milk, they would also be vegan. You would basically have a diet like a typical herbivore. Right. So what you're saying is some paleo diets from in your range of food consumption that you found would be classified as vegan. Mm -hmm. Correct. Right. So, so this idea that paleo diet is just meat and no potatoes, uh, that's just a misnomer. Yes, in a way. Yes. Yeah. You don't, there is, our stomachs and our guts, for example, are not adapted to just eat meat. We can't have a diet like a lion has nowadays. Mm -hmm. We just can't. So we are omnivores. We have to eat plant parts. And as we know, as Matt just said, he's vegetarian. And I used to be a vegetarian for 10 years and I'm fine. How do you know you're fine? <laughs> I feel quite you know? good, actually. <laughs> I feel okay. I didn't die. That you could be completely different. different now had you not. You don't know. You are I just you in any like moment. Another, yeah. <laughs> now, actually, Matt's collected questions for us from our fan base. So this is sort of a hybrid Cosmic Queries, but we still have so much more we want to learn from you directly. But Matt, why don't we throw in a question? Yeah, so I've got a bunch of questions from Patreon. Good. Uh, first of all, Josh V asks, what kind of evidence is considered when determining what an ancient tribe of people regularly consumed? Are there remains of food from tens of thousands of years ago? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, can food get fossilized the way other things can? Like, can you see, can you see a whole table setting fossilized in place? First of all, I have to say, I really like the word regularly in there. Oh, I hate it. I like it. <laughs> I'm not sure. But if I think about my, like, if my study to look at stable isotopes, I have one point in time from one individual. But it's actually really interesting to see what a whole tribe would eat and what it would regularly eat. So the actual study of food material, as you said, it's super difficult because most of the food decay. We know that. But however, if you have um, burned a meal, so by accidental cooking accident in your little cave or something, then material like seeds and pollen and grains can preserve over super long time scales basically indefinitely, if you have the right environment for them. And these plant remains, you can actually see, for example, if a crop was wild or cultivated already like by the structure they have. That, for example, dated like the earliest domestication of rice to like 11,500 um, years ago in, in China, for example. But of course, that is still not the long time scale we look at because you have to find those ashes basically with the food in it. But then there are lots of different um, fun things. For example, coprolites are really interesting. What is that? Coprolites. That what is, is that? Fossilized feces. Oh, <laughs> okay. Keep the other <laughs> name for it. <laughs> coprolite sounds much nicer. Sorry, I asked. <laughs> so you have fossilized feces. Okay. And you do have wonderfully preserved coprolites, where you can, of course, do different chemical or other. Um, analyzes with them to see what the animal ate, digested, and then left behind, basically. Yeah, I think there's a good scene in the original uh, Jurassic Park film where one of the scientists was an expert in studying the, the, the feces. Okay, and so the, yeah. the animal keeps moving and it's still kind of steaming. <laughs> oh, right? yes. <laughs> and then it reach in and we're all just kind of looking at that. <laughs> but it, it was, I'd forgotten that, yeah. I mean, it doesn't if, stink anymore 42 million years later. That's a good part. <laughs> I, don't, I don't believe you. <laughs> Depends on who did. But then we also have, of course, if you um, like think about human, like the oldest food, and there you have, for example, the oldest bread is like, 14,400 years old in Jordan. So that is even older than the, first, the start of agriculture. So you made it with by cereals. And one of the oldest thing I can think about right now is wine. So in Georgia, um, wine was produced 8,000 years ago. Just outside of Atlanta, I think, in Georgia. Oh. That's where they did that. Right? Okay. <laughs> the other one. The other one. Oh, oh, God. This is America. <laughs> so this is America. I heard... I heard uh, <laughs> 5,801 BC was a particularly good vintage. <laughs> really sunny, really nice, but it's quite expensive, yeah. 
So, so this, so you have a lot of access points into what we did. Into for with. me, which is a really young past, basically. Again, if I think about a million of years ago, it's it becomes, I mean, copulates, as I said, or you can have the um, dental calculus, which can have like pollen or like even DNA structures of whatever you ate. Um, but of course, something like the, the wine or the bread or some super old cheese from Egypt, for example, that is, of course, something what I consider just yesterday, from yesterday, basically. Right. And in another, you know, 100,000 years or so, your descendants will look at the uh, North America and what was once the United States, and they'll find perfectly intact Twinkies. <laughs> and, <laughs> Twinkies and, no and burgers. Don't like burgers also stay like McDonald's burger like forever? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I believe so. Yeah. So whether it can be preserved is a whole other thing because that changes whether it was preserved is another sort of effort Yes, to, yeah. to make that happen. Matt, give me another question. This uh, comes from Leslie Goodwill, but actually from Leslie's daughter, Trinity, who asks, how does the change in diet, uh, parentheses, cooked food, impact upon human development? Ooh. Can this be applied to other animals? Thank you. So, Tina, that question reminds me that today, among the many sort of paths of diets that people take, one of them is the raw food diet. Mm -hmm. All right. And so I never really understood that because I think the food tastes better if you cook it. Mm -hmm. But uh, this, th I think this is a brilliant question from Trinity, I guess, ask that. Yeah. Yes. I yeah. agree. It's very interesting. So if you cook food, you, you break up, for example, the starches in, in potatoes or something into easily like available energy rich sugars. So they are you still have the same stuff in your potato, but it's easily accessible for your body and you can actually use it. And um, so when cooked, you have a higher energy output of the same, the same food product, basically. So if you think about early hominins, which are like they have this brains that grew over time and they developed, um, they have lots of um, babies and fetuses and everything. So you would think about you have... Um, access to food that has higher energy, basically. So you spend much less time of actually eating, collecting. I mean, you spend time on preparing food and pounding and cutting and cooking, of course, but you would then have more of it. So you have more time for social behavior, for grooming. Um, I just think about, I, I was with, um, with primatologists in Mozambique in the Gorgonza National Park, and they, they look, they they. Um, study baboons and they took me a day on a field trip basically and I was giving a, a chart with the checklist and you would see what an animal and baboon does all day long and I had this checklist and it ate and ate and ate it just sits there and eats it has not that much time for anything else so for us we then had we had lots of energy to actually um, change our morphology basically to grow bigger brains to have more kids yeah did I hear Tina correctly Matt didn't she just say that had the baboon been given higher energy food, it would have time to like build spaceships and and you know yeah. and construct <laughs> and create a whole civilization. We, I think that's what she just said, right there. I think so, and that also worries me because uh, I'm still in lockdown and I'm just eating and eating and eating. So I'm pretty worried about being overtaken by the baboon. Right <laughs> that's now. right. Whatever that goes. So so Tina, what you're saying is, what percentage of your life do you spend tracking down food mm -hmm. to eat? then that's all you do for your survival. There's no free time. There's no leisure Basically, time. There's yes. no, you, you can't think up algebra. You know, there's no, there's no luxury you can't of thought learn that, stuff like that, this. that yeah. doesn't contribute to your own survival. And of course, and the own survival is of course also given by having kids. And um, we still benefit from this cooking of meat. If you think about, um, we only breastfeed for a year on average or something like this. And humans, modern humans, can have kids easily a year and a half apart. Um, so my, my sister, my older sister, is only one and a half years older than I am. And that is quite okay and normal. If you look at chimps, they're usually five years apart. But we have the advantage. We cook our food. We can mush it. We have all this energy in it. And um, then you, would, you are able to feed your kid much earlier food, like mashed up potatoes and carrots, and not just give it a potato potato or a carrot in a hand and let it munch on it. So this actually helped our species to evolve and to be successful as well. I think what you're really saying is it helped our species to get fat 
much earlier than others. That as well. That, that as well. As well. We're going to take another quick break when we come back more of this uh, installment of Star Talk, The Paleo Diet, when we return. So you're ready to earn your degree, but you need a university that works with your schedule. Well, WGU and their programs are built to be flexible. WGU offers a quality degree program that's affordable and even makes it possible to graduate faster. Plus, you can earn a respected bachelor's or master's degree for under $8,700 per year. Fees included. That's right. You heard me. That is the correct. It's not. Nope. $8,700 per year. Let your experience and dedication help you earn your degree faster. See what WGU's competency-based programs can offer you. With no set login times and 24-7 access to most coursework, you can really earn a respected bachelor's or master's degree on your own schedule. The low tuition rate covers as many courses as you can complete each term. That means the faster you learn, the more you'll save. Get your $65 application fee waived at wgu.edu slash star talk that's wgu.edu slash star talk for your 65 five dollar application fee poof gone waived now is the perfect time to turn your cool idea into a new website and you should do it with squarespace why do i say that because i have used squarespace personally to make two actually three websites, and it was beyond easy. It was a pleasurable experience. You'll find what you need, whether you're showcasing your work, blogging or publishing content, selling products and services, announcing upcoming events, or anything you can dream of. Buying a domain from Squarespace is easy because there are no hidden fees or price hikes. And get to know your audience with their analytics tools, which include insight on page views, traffic sources, time on site, audience geography, and more. It's so simple, too. Start with a design template and use drag-and-drop tools to make it your own. All websites are optimized for mobile right out of the box, so it looks great on any device. And every Squarespace website and online store comes with a suite of integrated features and useful guides that help maximize prominence among search results. So here's what you're going to do. Head to squarespace.com slash StarTalk for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, use the offer code StarTalk to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. That's squarespace.com slash StarTalk. Offer code StarTalk for 10% off. Hey, we'd like to give a Patreon shout out to the following Patreon patrons. Christina Magistrali, Torin Wallengreen, and Eric Huffman. Guys, thank you. No, seriously, thank you so much for your support. Without you, we couldn't do this show. And for anyone listening who would like their very own Patreon shout out, please go to patreon.com slash Radio and support us. <laughs> We're back. Star Talk. We're talking about Paleolithic peoples and what they ate and how that mattered in their lives. And then how did it help the birth of civilization? I want to go get back to Trinity's question about uh, eating raw versus cooked foods. Mm -hmm. um, I think I read a book or knew of a book that said that cooking food meant you didn't have to chew your meat as long. Mm -hmm. That and is also so, very true. You break the, the proteins in the meat are getting broken up already during cooking. So you get more out of your steak if you don't eat it raw, but if you eat it, well done. If you break the proteins, does that change their nutritional value to you? It just, it, I think it just makes it easier accessible for your body. So you can use more of the energy. You can use more of the energy and you get the energy in your body faster mm -hmm. so that you can spend less time chewing and more time inventing calculus. For example. <laughs> For, okay. Well, that, that also does cover Cody Klobuski's question uh, to an extent, which is what change did the addition of cooked meat make in the diets of early hominids? So specifically the meat. The meat, yeah. Yes, there we go. So I, but, so I think meat, as I said earlier, I tried to really pinpoint down which taxa would eat meat and when they would start and what effect this has on evolution, basically. Right now, we think about two and a half million years ago, that's... Um, um, without the ability of controlled fire, meat was already part of the of the diet. But then 
roughly 1.9 million years ago, a dramatic change began to occur in, in early hominin bodies. So um, they grew larger, the brains increased a lot in size and complexity, and they had adaptation for long distance running. And a long time it was thought that just because they had more access to meat, they had the, the resources, basically, the energy to do all this. But new studies suggest actually that they had control of fire during that time. So they were able to cook this meat. So it doesn't mean they wouldn't eat more meat, but it also means they would cook the meat and get more out of it, basically. So here's an interesting thought, I think. All right, so, right, you can't cook meat until you harness fire. So who had the idea <laughs> when they see a burning bush and say, let me put my meat in that and then well, eat it? That, this, is a, this is a brave person. But I think, and, I would think it would happen more like you have a wildfire and a day later you go back through it and you find a burned bobbit, a burned antelope or something. And then you would be like, huh, that smells tasty. That's what I could imagine. I, that's not my expertise. But. That's sure. That's got to be how it happened. Because otherwise you can't get close enough to the fire to think that anything good is going to happen by you interacting with it. But you're right, I'm hungry, and there's a thing, and the antelope is there, and I'm hungry, and it's like, yum, yum. Let's do this again. Very, very cool. Matt, give me another question. All right, and this one, I'm guessing, is a parent who's trying to get uh, kids to eat, because it's from <laughs> Avinav, Avinav <laughs> Abraham, and the question is, hey, Neil and Tina, is there any evidence of condiments being used by our early ancestors can't imagine the fuss created by the young ones to eat raw veggies and meat. <laughs> wow, I love that. Now, That's definitely a parent. What's the invention of sauce and, and ketchup? Yeah, give it to me. What do you have? Salt, pepper, what happened? <laughs> so as far as I know, condiments are not really known in our early ancestors. I, I can't imagine that happened like any time super early. Um, one early condiment I can think of is garum. So it's produced by crushing the innards of fish and then you ferment them with salt and that enhances your flavor. Like you have glutamic acid basically and it enhances the flavor of your, of your given food. And that was already used by like the Romans, but I think only the, the elites. So if you're super rich, you could afford this and you would pep your food with it. Okay, so Romans are like yesterday on your time exactly. scale. So exactly. it's easy to extrapolate backwards and say, no, nobody had ketchup or anything like I that. Don't, I can't imagine. But then again, there might be just the evidence might be not there. It doesn't mean it's not present. I just, or we just haven't found it. So I, as I say, the farther you go back in time, so much difficult it will be to find like this one mustard seed that's older than 3,000 years or something. Yeah, it could. It might have just started out where they just put different, you know, uh, foods have different flavors, and then you realize if you use one to help change the flavor of another one, that can make a whole new kind yes. of dish. Yeah. It could just be uh, the food ended up touching itself on the plate. <laughs> you say, hey, that's better hey, together that rather than, yeah, yeah, because, you know, kids hate that. Yeah. Um, well, would, would salt be, would you be able to detect any salt in someone's diet? Would there be more sodium or chlorine in their bones? or Because we naturally have salt in us anyway, right? We would, yes. We have quite a lot of salt. Um, and of course, we know salt has been used like for fermentation and for um, preservation. Pres yeah. Preservation, there's the word, thank you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I wouldn't know if you would find it in your, in your bones, basically. And as I said, bones are difficult because they're so porous. So they change during the time of fossilization. So it's always difficult to find anything like this out of, out of really old fossils, basically. So, so what about vitamins? Obviously, vitamins are a modern understanding yeah. of the needs in our foods, but paleo people obviously knew nothing of vitamins. Yet, so back to the previous question, if we know certain vitamins come to us from vegetables and little children hate vegetables, no reason why those children would love it and ours hate it. I'm guessing they hated vegetables too, but they needed it for their own health. Do you have any insights into the role of vitamins back then? I'm not sure about this. So I, I think, so I picture the kids of early hominins like chimps or something today, or as you said, they want the tasty fruit that has lots of sugar and not the boring plant with the vitamins or something. But I think what we lost over time a little bit is like the, sometimes you have a craving and then you really want, I don't know, a red pepper or something like this. So I think your body instantly often feels what it's lacking 
And so you have it in the in the wild too with animals of of yeah some some birds suddenly eating salt or something because they really need it. So I think this natural instinct might have been more present in um, in early hominins, and then possibly they would not hate it that much. There's a YouTube video of goats, mountain goats, ascending the side of a dam because the minerals in the rocks are high in salt. And they, they, and this ascending, and it's really, really steep. And they go up there and they start licking it. <laughs> and it was like, dude, just go to the local store. You know, I'm glad we have civilization. Yes. We'd, we'd be some dead humans attempting, attempting that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> But, uh, but it's about the challenge. It's about the, the joy of getting up there. Oh, that's what it's they're the telling journey. each other. That's what you're, you're sure <laughs> about that, man. Come on, Tim, let's go up there and lick some salt. <laughs> so, Matt, give me another one. Okay, so this one comes from Dave Armstrong and says, let's say we have a close shave on changing our planet and we actually live through it. It's a relatively pessimistic view, but plausible. Uh, what diet changes should we be making to prepare for climate change, including agricultural processes and systems? What diets sustained our ancestors through tough times? And what could we do to systemize them that for possible climate shift? Wow. Yeah, so Tina, you could be the number one source of insight that we can get when our world becomes so bad that yeah. either the animals go away or the crops go away. And you'll say, well, back, you know, uh, Lucy... The Australopithecus, she did this. So why don't we do that? Well, but she didn't make it. So let's do it different than Lucy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. But yeah, I really like this question. It's a tough one, but it's, it's cool. It's interesting because people usually think that we are such a successful species, so nothing can really happen at us. But if you think about it, Lucy and her whole taxa and her whole species and all of our other ancestors sooner or later went extinct. So they did not make it. So... It's interesting if we think about the current climate change and what that brings with us, it's much faster than what usually happened in the paleo record. Um, so it, it will happen, or it already starts to happen super quick for different reasons, of course, mostly from us and Jews. And um, it will be soon, it might be hotter on our planet than it has ever been during early hominin times, basically. So it will be new challenges. But so far, I think what brought us through it is flexibility. I only just figured out what you meant when you said Lucy, the Australopithecus, didn't make it. What you meant was that that entire hominid line didn't make it. Yeah. Because if they did, they'd still be, we'd have Australopithecus living next door, right? Exactly, yeah. If they, if they made it. So whatever it was they were doing with their environment, they went extinct. Yes. And okay. they just adapted in a different way. And one of the most keys of success for our species is thought to be the high flexibility. So we were able to survive um, ice ages, for example, and cold climate and warm climate and wet and dry climates and everything because also due to our big brains, we were able to adapt to different environmental pressures, basically. And I think we take this now to a totally different level. So if you think about adaptation or if I think about adaptation, I think about a different size of a jaw and longer legs or something like this. But if you think about it today, we build greenhouses. We ship water, like we transfer water from A to B to water some, some crops. We, I don't know, even shoot particles in the sky to, to um, introduce rain, for example, and stuff like this. So we alter our environment. To fit us. To fit us, basically. But that, of course, will only go to one ex extent. At some point, I think it will all be too bad. <laughs> Is it true that, well, that you find humans in more diverse, other than some small bacteria, perhaps, uh, you find humans in more diverse environments than any other animal? Yes, I think so. I, I think so. I mean, we have, we, we, and we are all like, we all look quite still alike, right? We, are, we should all be adapted to one ecosystem, but we make clothes um, and we, we eat different diets, possibly if we live in different um, regions to like, for example, to get more vitamin D if there's no sun around and stuff like this. So we inhabit every corner of this earth, basically, and no other species really is able to do that. Well, this also dovetails quite neatly into the final question, okay. which is ag from Agastya Suresh, says, I s I've seen Homo sapiens referred to as the childs of the Ice Age. If we were shaped in that extreme climate, what kind of evolutionary adaptations could we expect in the future, given extreme climate change? Mm -hmm. mm. So... 
actually thinking about the ice age, it's, the climate is not even that extreme. So what happens during a cold phase there is so much water gets bound on the, on the, on the northern hemisphere, basically. You have like kilometer thick ice stacks. And um, but it binds so much water that yes, it is colder, but it's also very dry. So you don't have this horrible icy rain that I would hate so much that you even with the modern clothing you can't really shelter from. So you have dry, cold environments. No, wait, you're telling me that the the, the famous joke about um, yeah, I visited hell. It, it was hot, but it was a dry heat. <laughs> <laughs> so now exactly. you're telling me the ice age it was cold but it was a dry cold which is much better which did you ever wait for the bus or something for 10 minutes standing yeah, there? And, yeah, okay, okay. I mean, I never, that's true i've definitely been warmer coming off a ski slope and just sitting in the sun having a beer yeah. than i have yeah. back in england in the <laughs> sleet and rain okay so, so when the, when the, our ancient so when Cave members waiting for a bus, they would have preferred dry. They would have. That's yes. what you're saying. Okay. And okay. what's really interesting there during that time, you have actually a similar in, in Europe, you had mammoth, you had um, woolly rhinos and lions and hyenas. So you have a different fauna than you would have in, in, in Africa in the savannas. So people actually, early humans migrating, found a setting they could actually work with and slowly adapt to, basically. Okay, so you're talking about adapting because we're smart and we can figure out how to shape an environment. You're not talking about an uh, evolutionarily adaptive aspect of us, correct? I mean, we, we can, you know, we can adapt because I, we can put on a coat. Yes. But if I, I think part of that question might have been, is there something in our evolutionary future? I think yeah. what would have to happen is the climate change would kill half the population and whoever survives, their bodies are just fine with it. Right? I mean, that's how evolution works. But over millions of years. So I think what we're facing right now millions, would okay. be really, uh, is really quick, basically. And I think there, the expansion of our brain and our intelligence is what hopefully will save us from this. So I, of course, the humans are also morphology still evolving. We do change. Our gut system changed to different, yeah, this lactose intolerance, for example, is a super new trait, basically. Mm -hmm. um, so we do evolve, we do change. Um, I don't think that if the climate gets hotter by two degrees Celsius very quick, that suddenly we will all adapt to that in a way of having sales we can, I don't know, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. evaporate our sweat better or something. I, I don't really see that <laughs> happen in the time frames we are looking at. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Except if we have control over the genome, then we play God, right? And, and we make whatever change oh God, we want. Yes. Ah, oh, that scary thought. Though. Yeah, that, that you know, I want six fingers so I can play the piano with, uh, you know, play more keys Just on more the piano. More complex chords. Yeah, exactly, exactly. See that that's in the possibly. We'll have to bring you back and comment on, <laughs> on that when that happens. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. yeah, can you extract uh, nitrogen isotopes from pianos? <laughs> <laughs> if they ate meat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. The carnivorous piano. <laughs> The famous carnivorous piano way back from the year 2050. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, Tina, we have to call it quits there. But uh, Tina Ludeke, I think uh, I, that's a little better yeah. than I began. <laughs> Great to have you on. Uh, this is an, a, a path of expertise. Like, who even thought that we have experts running around who think about this sort of thing? And it's great to have you and get a little slice of what your world is. And, uh, and so, Matt, always good to have you, man. Oh, it's lovely to be here. Thanks for having me. Okay, and it's science. Pro sometimes. Probably science. Probably. Pro probably, pro probably science. science. <laughs> probably That's the podcast. <laughs> probably science podcast. And I was delighted to have been a guest on your show. Oh, it was a treat. And invite, invite me again. I'll, we'll do it again. Oh, that's fantastic. I'd love that. Okay, excellent. So we got to call it quits there. I'm Neil deGrasse Tyson, your personal astrophysicist. And always, I bid you to keep looking up. With Masterclass, you can learn from the world's best minds anytime, anywhere, at your own pace. Learn how to ace your opponent from Serena. Improve your writing skills with Neil Gaiman. Learn how to negotiate with Chris Voss. All right, those were the courses I chose. But you'll have over 90 classes to make your own choice. And they're all taught by world-class instructors. Now, of course, the master instructor 
Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson has a masterclass of his own on scientific thinking and communication, and we all know how important that is in these times. I'm not the only one who's benefiting from my masterclass. My brother is an avid tennis player, and I sent him the gift of a subscription so he could get schooled by Serena. Did I tell him that it was a part of my subscription? Well, let's just say the answer rhymes with ho, ho, ho. From learning how to write anything from a book to a screenplay to communicating with your boss to how to make dinner worthy of a Michelin star or just the best scrambled eggs this side of a jumpy chicken, there's a master class for you. I'm in the middle of a course on sex and communication because I'm good at one of those things. Master class is accessible on your phone, web, or smart TV. You can get an annual membership to master class and give one to someone else for free. Free. Get unlimited access to every masterclass for you and a friend right now. Just go to masterclass.com slash star talk radio. That's masterclass.com slash star talk radio dot com slash star talk radio. That's masterclass.com slash star talk radio.